Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to the Hoover Institution. My name is Erin Witcher. I'm an associate director here, and I'm really looking forward to the talk this evening about Across the Great Divide, a new perspective on the financial crisis uh, with Martin Bailey from the Brookings Institution, John Taylor from the Hoover Institution, and I'm moderated by Alan Murray with Fortune Magazine. Uh, for those of you who haven't grabbed your complimentary copy of the book, be sure to get it before you head out the door. And after our talk this evening, the bar still will be open, so be sure to grab a drink. Thank you. I'll turn it over to you, Alan. Great. Thank you very much. And, and I should say at the outset that uh, 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 I didn't attend the event, but I have read the book. So my experience is the same experience many of you will be. I strongly recommend the book. But I want to start, uh, John and Martin, I want to start uh, with a quote at the very beginning of the book, because apparently George Schultz said at the end of, by the way, I, I should just take a step back and say, this was an extraordinary event in that it took place on both coasts at the same time, correct? Right, exactly. What was the, t you, you were making, going back and forth in presentations, but. Uh, yeah, and, and the discussion and, and speakers from both places. And so it really was uh, spanning Brookings and, and Hoover. That, that was the idea, and that's, of course, part of the title. And it worked. It worked, actually. For almost no glitches. And we could see the other group, and I could see Martin, he could see me. And we so could see, yeah. so what, I, what I was struck by after reading the book, there's a, there's a quote from George Schultz in which he said that it seemed at the end of the event that there was more agreement than everyone expected. I had a hard time reading the book, finding the agreement. So, so why don't we? You had the wrong expectation. <laughs> I might have had the wrong expectation, but why don't we start the discussion uh, with both of you uh, uh, telling us that the, it was a very diverse group of people. Obviously, at the end of the discussion, where where was the surprising agreement to you, John? Well, there was agreement, uh, for example, on the reason we had the price quite a bit of a surprising agreement there because, as you know, there's hundreds of explanations that are out there. And I'd say people focused on two uh, as more important than others. One is the Federal Reserve's holding interest rates lower uh, than normal in 2003, 4, and 5. Too low, too long. It was That's a monetary the, policy mistake. Right. And, and uh, people would maybe disagree on how, how large that was, how significant, but quite a bit of agreement from, uh, from people at the conference. And the other thing which was mentioned as a cause was I would call it sort of lax regulatory policy where it wasn't so much that the, the laws were uh, insufficient but the enforcement of the laws was not taken seriously enough. And those two things together is what a lot of people focused on. I would say that's an area of agreement. Martin? Yes, I, I, I think that's, uh, that's right. And, and the emphasis would be different, but I think it was uh, something that we both uh, uh, were able to, both of those causes, I think. The other thing that I think there was a fair bit of agreement on is the need to, to find a way to resolve large institutions, to let them fail without having to prop them up or to have taxpayers' money put at risk. Uh, and we don't want to... I mean, this is not a criticism because I think we were in a crisis and the handling of the crisis, uh, you know, you, you have to, people had to do what they had to do, but we don't, certainly don't want to go through that again where we, we let Lehman fail and then two weeks later we, we prop up AIG. So there was a sense that we need a, a failure resolution uh, mechanism. And uh, there's, there's some differences about how much we should rely on bankruptcy versus the Title II that was part of Dodd-Frank, can we get liquidity, what, what, the, what the resolution process should be like, can we in fact resolve big institutions or should they be broken up? So there's certainly areas of disagreement, but I think there was actually a lot of agreement too. So, so uh, agreement that monetary policy was, uh, lax monetary policy prior to the crisis uh, was a, a central cause, agreement that lax regulatory policy was a, was a cause. Uh, some disagreement about uh, the resolution. We'll come back to that in a minute. But how about the central events? For instance, is there agreement that letting Lehman fail was a mistake? I think the agreement was that the policy was kind of erratic. Uh, maybe Martin and I will have some disagreements, but there was a period, we remember going back to Bear Stearns, where it was, you know, why they do that was controversial. 
and then maybe a sense in which we will do that again if the time comes. It wasn't said explicitly, but there was that impression left out there. And then it didn't happen in Lehman, so that was a surprise, and it did happen with AIG. So it was more the erratic nature that I would focus on as the problem. But how about you yeah. personally, uh, when it comes to you know bailing out Bear Stearns, not bailing out Lehman, bailing out AIG, bailing out the GSEs, which of those would you have I done would, differently? I would, I would believe in the case of Bear Stearns, I would not have done it at that Let time. it go. Yeah. Let it fail. Well, yeah, absolutely. There's a, let me say, just a little color to this. When you're in government and you're in that room and the information is somewhat limited, it is difficult to make the decision. I've been in government. I've seen cases where you want to rescue a player or an entity. Maybe it's a country if you're the IMF. And it's, it's difficult to make that decision. So what I would do in that room, I could just guess. But I wasn't there, so I don't know. But I would say I would certainly have tried not to do it in the case of Bear. And if we did, I think the most important next would be to say exactly as much as you could, what the circumstances under which you would do that again, to try to lay out a strategy for a bailout. So the rules are clear. Rules, yeah, exactly. Martin, would you? Um, I think with the benefit of hindsight, I would not have let Lehman fail. Um, I think just as there were reasons that to bail, bail companies out, I think at the time, uh, the, the Fed, I think, believed that this would not have the, the repercussions that I think it did have. Uh, there was a sense, certainly, that Paulson, I think, felt that uh, we, we couldn't bail everyone out, so it was time to take a stand. And I don't think he realized, I don't think any of us realized what was going to happen if they let Lehman, uh, Lehman fail. I mean, I thought probably it was a good thing at the time. With the benefit of hindsight, no, I wouldn't have, uh, have let Lehman fail. So, but so, I, yeah. I do, what, just, just to add, yeah. since we're talking about failure resolution, that doesn't mean I want to go back to, uh, you know, in the next crisis that I want to bail everyone out. And, and we will get to that. But so uh, you would let them fail, you wouldn't let them fail, but both of you agree that it, there was a sense of, of inconsistency, yes. not clear what the rules were. Uh, well, uh, what, what about the TARP? What about the taxpayer bailout? Uh, good idea? Bad idea? So here I would say that what was bad is the rollout of that. Um, going to Congress with three, two and a half pages of legislation saying we need this passed and if you don't pass it it's going to be Armageddon and by the way we don't know exactly how it'll work. I think that was the main problem uh, and I think if you look at the data it was really at that point it wasn't really Lehman it was at that point where the market the market, market fell off and I think that's in, in, a, in hindsight for sure but I remember that was testi the testimony uh, in the banking committee and it just seemed to me that rollout just was... But you don't bad. necessarily object to the decision to use taxpayer funds or inject so them here's, in the banks? So here's what I think. If you look carefully at what was happening at the banks in, say, as early as August 2007, you could see some real counterparty risks that were rising. You could see some problems in the, in the balance sheets. I did some research on that at the time. For me, I think that was the time to begin to address these balance sheet problems at the bank. At the banks, so I think it would have been much less of a problem if they'd done it that point. Yeah, Martin. Well, certainly, if we'd done it earlier and we didn't have to use TARP, that would have been much, much better. Or if banks had more capital as they're now being required to have, that would have been uh, much better. At the time, it was essential, and it 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 turned the it turned the tide. I mean, remember that the economy was pretty much in free fall. Uh, the global banking system was was in serious trouble. And uh, with the availability of the top and, and the ability to say, okay, we're going to do stress tests, we're going to say how much capital they need, and if they don't have it, we're able to provide it. And I think that created a turning point in the, in the so, crisis. So actually, the turning point occurred when people understood what the TARP was about. You had this... You had this. In, in, including the people who yeah. were in charge of the TARP, yeah, figuring I mean, out what the TARP was, was the, about. The markets just, just 25 30% drop, and the markets from the time came until they changed October 13th. They said, this is not what we said, this is going to be just injection. Exactly. And, and, that, and that stopped that panic, and we were in a new world at that point. So it's not so much it's that rollout problem. Is it? But, but that's not surprising given the sort of sense of panic uh, at the time, right? There was a feeling you had to act fast. There wasn't a lot of time to sit around and figure out how to perfectly articulate the policy. There's a lot of time from Bear Stearns a lot of time from Bear Stearns. I, I don't, Bear I don't Stearns in that. March to yeah. the TARP in September. But I don't think we, we I say we because I didn't either, 
uh, realized how severe things were going to be, and and that uh, that the housing price collapse was going to do what it what it did. What about the regulatory response, Martin? You you uh, write about that, talk about that. Uh, uh, Dodd Frank uh, on balance, good thing, bad thing. Uh, I supported Dodd Frank, and I still do. There are some things about it that that uh, I would not have done the same way. I think there were some amendments to Dodd Frank which have created trouble, both the Volcker Amendment, the Lincoln Amendment, Collins, which are, they're trying to adjust. Um, but I think it was uh, uh, important to to uh, have this new urgency around use of uh, financial regulation uh, to make sure that we've got enough capital that we uh, committed this. I mean, out of Dodd-Frank came this resolution process and the single point of entry. So yes, I think uh, Dodd-Frank in my mind was a good thing. It doesn't mean I think it was perfect. On balance, good thing, bad thing? I think it's been harmful. On balance. On balance. The excess regulations, the uncertainty, Martin mentioned a few of them. I think that Title II evolved into the single point of entry. Single point of entry, I think, is a good way to move ahead, but that could have, and indeed, I think it's the preferred way now for through bankruptcy. So, so, yeah. So you also talked at the event about the effects of the crisis, and I think, uh, and uh, Larry Summers was there, and I think that may have been the first time that he started talking about something he's been talking about a lot since, which is this, this notion of secular stagnation. Uh, uh, do you buy that? Uh, are we in a particularly bad period of time for the economy? And if so, why? Well, thanks for asking about that, because Larry did present for the first time at that meeting the secular stagnation, and that was the same session I was in and had a, have a completely different view of this issue. But where there is agreement is that we have had a very slow, disappointing recovery by almost any measure. There, for a while, there was a debate about that. Yes, you get slow recoveries after deep recessions, but now after six years, that's just that's there's an agreement. This is unusual, and the, de and the debate is about why. So at the conference, Larry offered the idea that it's it's secular, things have changed, um, investment opportunities are lower, savings is too high, uh, and that's created this this slow growth, secular stagnation. And what I've been writing about. For a long time now, is there's is a policy problem here that's causing this growth. We have not had such a huge increase in the amount of interventions, whether it's regulatory, whether it's fiscal policy, whether it's monetary policy. And if you add all that up together, I think that's really the ex explanation. E equal weight for those uh, no, three? No, I couldn't give equal weights. I think if I had to, if you made me choose, it would be more the regulatory at this point. Regulatory you know, policy. Because you mentioned Dodd Frank, and, and no matter what you think about the Healthcare law, that's a big increase. If you look at just the number of, of uh, federal employees involved in regulation, it's moved up quite a bit. But you also you also wrote the monetary policy has, you, the, you said there was agreement that monetary policy before the crisis was part of the problem. There's obviously disagreement about whether monetary policy has gotten it right since the crisis, but you're on the side of, of it being a mistake. Just to be a little more specific, I think the actions the Fed took during the panic Mm -hmm. uh, where they made loans to financial institutions and actually made swap loans to other central banks. I think that was good classic central banking in, in October, November 2008. But starting in 2009, the massive increase in the balance sheet, the quantitative easing, the operation twist, those are where I begin to evolve a bit. Martin, why is the why has the recovery been so unsatisfying? I think it is, in part, a legacy of a financial crisis. The, the banks are making money now, so they're sort of sound, um, but I don't think uh, lending is back to its normal um, pattern. Uh, I do think that, that maybe the regulatory pendulum has swung too far in the direction of being too cautious, um, that uh, the banks making loans are uh, worried about the regulators over their, their shoulders. So I do think that's something uh, that's a concern. I am concerned about regulation becoming uh, too much of a problem. I don't think that's the main reason today why we uh, why we have a slow recovery, but it's certainly something that I uh, I think I can agree with John that that uh, is we need to we need to streamline and make our regulation more efficient uh, and effective and not get in the way uh, of growth. But I also have I, again I wouldn't side with Larry Summers and say we have secular stagnation. 
Um, because I don't think we have. Uh, for one thing, we still have a, uh, a trade deficit, so we're still, in some sense, propping up demand around the, the world, not as much as we used to, but, but uh, we can't afford to do it now because we don't have enough of our own, uh, uh, own domestic demand. But I think there is a, there is a problem because the, the proportion of uh, investment uh, in current dollars has been declining and that's partly because investment is getting cheaper. A lot of it is now technology, and technology prices go go down. But that means it doesn't investment doesn't generate the same amount of, of uh, demand and employment in our domestic economy. Housing is still pretty weak. I mean, it, it, the amount of uh, residential construction is still low. So we're, we're on investment side, we're, st- we're, we're, we're down. And the housing, we haven't found something to replace the, the housing. But are there policy- and we've got a trade deficit. Yeah. So I think we do have a... But are there policy... Problem. John clearly sees policy causes behind those things. Do you? Well, I would probably point to a different policy, which is that we have had, a, in the last couple of years, in 12 and 13, we've had somewhat contractionary fiscal policy, which I think has slowed the economy down. Um, so I would, um, I would probably... Uh, favor using a, some kind of well-planned infrastructure program to try to boost the economy up. Uh, and I think the fact that we haven't been able to do that is, is, is a policy mistake. The Fed, I think, is, is doing everything it can. It's just that, that it's reached the limit of what it can do. But you have no problem with what it's done, quantitative easing? I don't think the quantitative easing has been particularly effective, um, but... Uh, but not objectionable. I, I don't... Well, the... There were people who said when they were doing it that this was going to bring runaway inflation. And instead, inflation has actually declined a little bit. John, quantitative easing. Well, I think it's, I don't think it's been effective. I've done several studies of it. I maybe did the first study of it back in 2009 and found that it really didn't do what, uh, what it was supposed to do. If you just look at spreads, they went the wrong way. QE3 spreads were higher than before QE3. Uh, long-term interest rates higher after QE3 than before. So there's other reasons for that, but I just don't see much... Better not to have gotten into it at all. I think as soon as the actions were taken in 2008, which were heroic in many respects, that was the time to get back as fast as possible to normal policy. And we remember, we never had a recovery in the real sense of the word. We never had that 4 or 5%, even 6% growth as we've seen after previous deep recessions like in the early 1980s. I'm afraid people have written it off completely. We just we missed it. We're never going to get it. It's just going to be two percent. If we're lucky, two and a half percent growth going forward. And it's, but it's you really think po- you think policy different policies would have changed that? I do. I think a a, a regular monetary policy, a, a, a the, the stimulus package itself. Uh, that's part of the reason you got this up and down. That we made a big effort to increase infrastructure spending. The states largely just just pocketed the money. But so just to make sure I understand the transmission mechanism here, you're saying that the investment, the decline in investment that Martin is talking about is because of, of erratic policies. Largely. La- yeah, lack of confidence big, in erratic policies. Big part of it. And remember, there's been an increase in regulation. It, it, there's a lot of anecdotal uh, characterizations of this by businesses. They're sitting on a lot of cash, as are the banks for that matter. Um, short-term investment, short-termism. So there's something there, uh, and I think that's what I've been arguing for since this happened, and it's still there's more and more evidence that that's the case. It's Mark, you would say there's something there, but maybe not quite as, as big as John thinks it is. Uh, I think if you, if, well, um, the, the IMF ran an uh, investment function, a uh, simple sort of accelerator, and they found that uh, investment really isn't out of line with what you would expect given overall growth. Now, it hasn't led us to faster growth, uh, but I don't think uh, investment as in, in real terms has really been the, the, the weakness that, that John describes. Uh, it's just that we haven't been able to replace the stuff that we've lost, and particular, in particular the housing. Uh, the, the, you know, with the expansion after 2000 was uh, largely driven by housing. So one of the, uh, it seems to me, one of the most important things you do in the book is say, have we done things here that will prevent the next crisis? Um, are we in, in, in a, a better, better shape to deal with this sort of thing in the future? Are we? Are we? I think we are. Uh, I think increasing the amount of capital is, uh, is probably the first thing that we've done. 
Uh, there are also re regulations around uh, liquidity and stable funding. Um, and I think those are a good thing, whether they've been done exactly the right way is a different matter, but, but uh, I think those things have, have made us a lot safer. Have we eliminated think, too big to fail? I think we're on the way to eliminating too big to fail, which I think is a, is a huge, huge deal, yes. Yeah, Are we in better shape? I don't think we're there yet, uh, too big to fail. I think the, some of the things we discussed at this conference and are in the book are helping us get there. Uh, and I think a lot of it is the reform of the bankruptcy code. The, uh, the idea would be that a large financial institution would be able to have a plan, they're not called living wills, that came out of Dodd Frank, through which they could, in the worst of circumstances, go through a bankruptcy without uh, support, without liquidity support. In fact, the law requires that they submit a living will uh, in which they could unwind um, without liquidity support. The, the Fed and the FDIC <coughs> rightly, I think, have rejected those plans right now, and so they're revising them. We don't know what will come back, but I think the model that what should come back is a plan, is a whatever you want to call it, living will, may not be the right term, but it's a plan that shows how they can unwind uh, in, in, the, in the case of a, of a shock. With, they have to have, of course, enough uh, capital or enough, they call loss loss absorbing capital at this point, to do this. But it seems to me when they get to that point, then you, you have the possibility that too big to fail is gone. But right now, I don't think it is. But is that a realistic goal? I mean, uh, can, will we reach the point where uh, J.P. Morgan, given all the the roles it plays in the in the financial system right now, can be allowed to fail? Um, it, it depends what you mean by by failure. Remember, a lot of the airlines have failed, but they're, they're still they're still, they're still around. Um, and so, something as big as J.P. Morgan, you certainly don't want to be in the situation where the, the the bank is closed and you go to get your money out and and uh, you can't get in. No, we, we, we certainly can't do that, and we don't do that even with, with smaller banks. So you have to have the operational capabilities continue. Uh, but I think that the single point of entry approach, which says the costs are borne by the shareholders and by the long-term unsecured debt, uh, and not, then not by taxpayers, uh, allows you to lift off the holding company and keep the rest of the operation going, and then it can be reformed, and then parts of it maybe will go... Uh, be, be uh, wound down and parts of it will be sold in the end. But I think we could get to that point with uh, J.P. Morgan. I think we're always going to have to have uh, some liquidity provided either by the central bank, by the Fed, or by the FDIC. So I think it'd be difficult. In, in normal bankruptcy, you know, United Airlines can, will get you know, dip financing and get it from the private sector. But I think a big, something as big as J.P. Morgan You'd need, and, uh, and the kind of unwinding that both of you are talking about does require some changes in the law. I think the bankruptcy law needs to be uh, reformed to make this happen, yeah. So it has to allow for this analogy of single point of entry. And the, the, the bankruptcy judges, whoever is going to has to know this game, have to know what they're doing. Can so, you just explain briefly the single point of entry concept? You basically treat the institution at, at its holding company level rather than look at the individual uh, subsidiaries or components of the firm, and that's where the support comes from. So it's single point of entry in the sense you go at the whole You go in at the holding company level, not at the subsidiary level. A any chance that will happen? That will happen? The legal changes. Um, well, it, this approach could be used under Title II, and I think it's possible that even that, without, will, even without well, that, that will happen. Um, is there a chance the bankruptcy law will change? Well, we were talking earlier about, you know, are there things that can be done in the next couple of years, um, given that uh, we have now a Republican-controlled uh, Senate and as well as a House and a Democratic president. Uh, it's possible that, that that could be done. I know that uh, you're not very optimistic about uh, uh, that kind of cooperation, but you never know. It's something that could, it could happen. I, I want to go back to monetary policy uh, um, because I do think it was striking that there, in the, in the book, that there is a is agreement that monetary policy made mistakes leading up to the crisis. And I think Peter Fisher, who worked at the Federal Reserve uh, uh, and at the Treasury, said at one point that uh, the Fed either should have had tighter monetary policy leaning against the wind or should have had a policy to deal with the impending bubbles. Uh, uh, now, going forward, we're in pretty much the same situation, interest rates near zero for a long, long time. 
uh, is the second option. Uh, you, the, the book talks a lot about macroprudential policy, which I'm not sure I completely have my head around. But is there anything that the Fed can really do to stop bubbles short of tightening monetary policy? Why don't you stop? Well, I think it, macroprudential sometimes has the connotation that the Fed's going to somehow increase capital requirements and then bring them back down again. It's sometimes called counter-cyclical capital requirements. I think that's really a mistake. It's fine-tuning at its worst. I don't think they can estimate the impacts very well. So to me, you have, you have monetary policy, which is it can be counter-cyclical, focused on inflation, but also the real economy. And so for me, the best macro potential is you get the levels right. In other words, you get the capital ratios right. You get the liquidity ratios right. But that's, just plain old, but that's just plain old-fashioned macroeconomic policy. I'd say the main difference would be you're cognizant that they maybe should be higher because of this Because of potential effects. for bubbles. Because yeah. of this, in, yeah, and the interaction effect. So macro would mean you've got to think not just about that individual firm, but the relationship. And so to me, that suggests there will be higher capital ratios. But the moving it around problem is, I think, difficult. Martin? Um, yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical. I, I mean, I think you... Under certain circumstances, you might want to do it. Um, you know, I've, I've heard people giving speeches down at Yale and saying, Listen, we need to add this because uh, interest rate policy is too blunt an instrument. But I think these other policies are also a fairly blunt instrument. They, are, they, are, they do have the authority to do it in the UK, and I don't know whether they, they will, but historically they have uh, adjusted things like loan-to-value ratios, uh, requirements of, uh, for mortgages. Um, so I think, I think it should be something that we have the authority to do um, because even if, I think even if interest rates had been somewhat higher going into the crisis, we, we might still have had uh, uh, a crisis. Maybe it would have been less severe, but, but still have had, had it. But I, I agree with John. The, the main thing is to get the capital levels right to begin with. But so where are we right now? Uh, we've been running this extraordinarily easy monetary policy for a long time. Uh, do you see problems developing out there? Is this a, it, do we have the macro prudential policies right at the moment? I think uh, the, we don't have the monetary policy right at the moment. That's, that's what you're focusing. It seems to me we're, we're behind the curve, and I wouldn't think about this as that uh, usual. Policy worked really well for the 80s and 90s until we started these unusual policies. So to me, they're a problem. We get back to them, we'll be much better off. So I would, the first priority for monetary policy is gradually, strategically get back to the policies that were working. Do you see bad economic effects out there as a result of? I think well, I think they're already bad. I think the for, for the, instance, uh, well, the recovery has been very slow. As a result there's, there's, of. If I, you ask As a, I, but I mean, it's just kind of a, it, it, it's it's different than the way a lot of people think about monetary policy to say that the recovery has been slow because policy has been too easy. Uh, I didn't say just too easy. I At the moment, though, that's your. Uh, I say it's too erratic. People don't know when it's going to be back to normal. It's not just easy is the wrong word, by the way. I think it's it's not rule like. It's not systematic. So it creates it, uncertainty. Creates a great deal of uncertainty, and it also. Some markets have not been functioning. The money market has not functioned with the zero rates. Uh, quantitative easing is is uh, over for the time being, but people talk about a QE4 sometimes. So you're in potentially a new world, which uh, I don't think people have fully figured out. If you look globally, you, you know, macro credentials is used all over the place right now because some countries have these low interest rates. They have no choice if, if, about their using loan-to-value ratios to try to stop bubbles. So if that and that's a global thing. I would say just it is not uh, insignificant now that you have these massive changes in policy in Japan and in Europe. There's, there's almost they're responding in many ways to the Fed. You know, QE begins here, it follows in Japan, it goes to Europe, it's up in Japan. So that's a that's a phenomenon that is uh, I don't think it's trivial in terms of its negative effects globally. And Martin, what's your sense of where we are in terms of monetary policy? Uh, I think I would I'd give much higher marks to the Fed than, than John would. I would have thought a Taylor Rule would tell you um, that we want pretty easy monetary policy because growth has been uh, been so weak. As I said, I, I don't know that QE has been all that effective, but on the other hand, I don't see that it's done uh, a lot of harm either. I don't think that's, uh, I think the uncertainty really has been around the strength of the recovery and, you know, the euro crisis and a lot of those things. 
rather than necessarily around uh, monetary policy. So I'd give higher marks to monetary policy. And I, they are now ending uh, QE, and I think probably uh, they will start to uh, let interest rates rise as well. You concerned about developing bubbles? Do you see effects in the economy from? I don't see I don't see bubbles in the in the U.S. economy. No, the the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, warned that, that these low interest rates for too long were going to create uh, a reach for yield. I, I do think that's a danger, so I think it's a legitimate thing to be concerned well, about, but yet. I don't see us being there yet. And when, when the signs of it appear, you think it's pretty easy to address? Easy may be the wrong word, but it can be addressed. Um, well, I, you never quite know what's going to come out of left field, and that's one reason you want your financial system and your financial institutions to be robust, because right. you don't know what's, what's coming at you. Uh, so I'm not going to say it would be easy, but, but I think, yes, we would have a better chance today of spotting it than we did. Do you want to respond to that? Or you? What I think is difficult to, to answer your question, I sympathize with, with Martin's uh, halting response. You, uh, <laughs> you don't know where these things show up. You can see there's imbalances. There's very unusual policies. Uh, in 2003, 4, and 5, there's very low interest rate. You didn't know at the start this was going to show up in housing or search for yield or... So what we can do as economists to point out these imbalances, say they've had problems in the past, and try not to do it because they're usually not necessary. And then that avoids it. But you, you, it's hard to say where it's going to show up. I think that's one of the whole problems with this. But history leads you to believe it will show up somewhere. So what, I'm going to open it up to, to uh, questions and comments in, in just a minute. But before I do, uh, 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 one of the first papers presented at the at the conference was by uh, Sheila Bear, who was here just a minute ago, but had to run off and and uh, uh, catch a train. Uh, and, but she talked about the causes of the crisis, and she listed as one of the cro uh, causes what she called the self-regulating market myth. Have, did we learn something fundamental in the crisis about the degree to which the market does or doesn't regulate itself? I believe we did. I, I think it, it um, a, a lot of people thought that, you know, derivatives markets or even that, that banks could be uh, somewhat self-regulating or largely self-regulating um, because uh, people were putting their own money or that, that, that shareholders' money and shareholders would, would watch what happened to the money and that we wouldn't get into this the kind of crisis that we got into. So I think we learned that, uh, yes, uh, people were willing to take risks with other people's money, but I think they also took strange, excessive risks with their own money, and that was something of a surprise that they would do that to the extent they did. John? I think uh, Sheila's characterization is, is similar to what we were saying earlier. There was a lax laxity of the regulations, but to me, it wasn't so much that we, we changed the law so that it was we self-regulated. It was that the regulators kind of were asleep at the switch. And maybe that was because of this attitude. I don't know. I don't know why. It's, it, you know, regulatory capture is what sometimes people say goes on, is that the regulators get too close to the institutions themselves and that let, let things happen. You could characterize that as it's going to be self-regulation, but I think it's, there's other ways to think of it. The laws are on the books. What they should enforce is clear, and I think they didn't in this case. And I don't know all the reasons for it. Again, regulatory capture, insufficient skills, Salaries too low by the regulators compared to the businesses. A lot of a lot of things been, have been put out there. But how do you fight that? How do you keep it from happening again? And I think it, si keeping it as simple as possible is the best way to deal with the regulatory capture. I, I would say that's number one. Keep it simple because it is hard to enforce these things. But it, it could come so back. In other words, it's, less it's discretion. The more discretion you have, the more opportunity there is for it's mistakes, for regulatory it. capture, etc. Yeah. Well, I think, I, think um, I, I agree with the danger of regulatory capture, and I think it did, it did go on, so I, I agree with a lot of that. Um, I think that there is an opportunity to try to improve the quality and the pay of our regulators. Uh, I think that would be uh, a help, and that we have some proposals that we've put out at the Bipartisan Policy Center about about doing that. A any sign of those things happening, you think? Is there not, political support? None. <laughs> okay. not, not yet, but uh, we're hopeful. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, please identify yourself before you ask your question, and, and we have mics.
Arnold Clay, I want, I want to follow up on this, this last point about regulations not being enforced. I, I actually can't think of, of an existing regulation that, if enforced better, uh, w would have taken care of the problem. I think that the problems were the regulations themselves. I mean, it wasn't like, here, here's an example, the Basel Capital Accords. I don't think that they were not enforced. They were, in, in hindsight, misguided. Or the affordable housing goals that were given to the GSEs. Those were not, you know, it wasn't a lack of enforcement. It was misguided in the first place. So I'm wondering if you just give some examples of these unenforced regulations that led to the crisis. I think the things that I'm mainly referring to is just the, the excessive risk that was being taken by those, especially commercial banks and large financial institutions. And that's the, the regulators are supposed to be watching for that. Uh, you could say that just after the fact, but I think there's lots of, of reasons to believe that the risks were too high at the time. With respect to the GSEs, I think that's clearly an example of regulatory capture. Uh, you have lots of things those institutions which were, do, were doing which were way too risky. So that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's, uh, it's how they're enforced, what they get away with. But the GSEs were following the trend in housing, not necessarily leading it. I mean, could the regulators, I mean, there's the, the now uh, uh, famous moment when Ned, Ned Graham Allen, walked yes. into Alan Greenspan's office and said there's crazy stuff going out there in the housing markets, you know, no down payment loans. Uh, we, you, uh, we don't, you don't have to show us you have an income to pay for it. Uh, could they have done something about that? Well, I think, um, I think Alan Greenspan has, has said that he was surprised. He thought markets would be self-regulating to a greater extent than they were. So I think he has expressed publicly uh, the view that, that he was, he was uh, surprised by what happened. He thought there would be more, more sense, if you like, um, in the, on the people who were taking risks. I think also... Um, a lot of the bad origination was coming out of uh, institutions that really weren't regulated, or they were state, regu state regulated. These were small, non-depository state institutions. Now, as it went up the pipeline, it went into some other big banks, but it went, also it went into these special investment vehicles, so the regulators didn't see it. So there was this evasion of the regulation. But, but, it, but it gets to the question about regulation. If Alan Greenspan had had a different reaction, could he have... Maybe not stopped it cold in its tracks, but put out some Fed warning, something that would have changed the course of the uh, uh, housing bubble. Well, that's a that's a what if question. Um, it would it would I'm sure he would have liked to have done more with with the benefit of hindsight. Remember, he warned about frothiness in the stock market in in 1996, and the stock market continued to rise for Could several years after something? that. Uh, I think the New York Fed could have done a better job. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And By they, talking to the banks and saying, "Knock it off." Well, that's their job. They had, they, you know, there are hundreds of regulators for the New York Fed on the premises of the banks. It's yeah. not like you have to do anything special to talk to somebody. So that's in in the case of the uh, Fannie and Freddie. I think Greenspan was one of the people trying to lead to rein them in in various ways, at least the institutions, and the Treasury was there for a while too. So I'm not sure. I think people recognize that, but you're, it was a political issue, and I think it was regulatory capture with respect to those institutions. So I agree on Fannie and Freddie. I wanted to ask you. Uh, just of, introduce yourself. Uh, uh, John Hilsenrath from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of slightly contradictory questions. One, one for John. Um, so in 2008, the U.S. and the U.K. and the Euro area were confronted with banking crises and severe recessions. Uh, the U.S. pushed interest rates to zero, did several rounds of QE, and did stimulus, which was slowly unwound. The euro area, and the U.K. policy was close to that, but not identical. The euro area didn't do QE and fiddled, didn't bring interest rates down quite as much uh, and ran a tighter fiscal policy, and we seem to be in much better shape right now. So. Uh, What's your response to that? Do you, why would you argue that our policy has been ineffective in light of that evidence? And then for Martin, I just wanted to ask you. This you is the country. the other direction, because I like that question. Yeah, well, so in the <laughs> yeah, other direction. He's not going to give that one to you. Yeah, I mean, he, here we are four or five years later, and interest rates are, near, are very low again, and uh, 
the private sector is deleveraged, but leverage in the public sector has gone much higher. So there's still a lot of leverage in our economy. So why aren't we right back where we were five years ago with the precursors to another bubble building? You want to take your question first? Sure. So I think this comparison <laughs> with the U.S. and, and uh, in Europe and the Eurozone is, is just not appropriate. It's a completely different set of circumstances. I sympathize much more with uh, the ECB. It's put together with different entities as the, the periphery at the, at the lower end. It's just, a, you know, Greece has the... Has, has an economic policy worse than sub-Saharan African countries. I mean, just a lot of other things going on. So that, that one comparison at one point in time, it, it doesn't, doesn't help me at all understand what's going on. There are a lot of countries out there you can make comparisons with that are doing just fine. Think, think of the emerging market countries, how they responded so well to that crisis, much better than we did, much better than Europe did. They basically stuck to the policies they started adopting beforehand. They're, some of them are having trouble now. And that's true. A lot of countries didn't, and they did just fine. Um, and the if you look at our, the details of our stimulus, as I mentioned before, a lot of that money was sent to the states, and they just pocketed it. It really wasn't something. China's stimulus was completely different than the U.S.'s anyway. So that's that comparison doesn't uh, doesn't seem relevant to me at all. There's a uh, if you think about comparisons of countries, you, you got you know as a as a as an economist, you look at many. You don't just look at two at one point in time. So I'm, there's many other things that I would look at. Also, U.S. history. Just that you want to look at the U.S. It's the same economy, at different points in time. And when, when did we do so? When we did we do much better? We did better when we didn't have a very interventionist fiscal policy. We just got the tax rates down. We looked at balancing the budget. Monetary policy was systematic and, uh, and it, as I say, rule-like. If you look at the 70s, it wasn't that. It was a terrible performance. And if you look in the last 10 years, it's a terrible performance. That's the same economy, different points in time, different policies. And that's, I think, quite revealing by, by uh, empirically. Uh, and it's consistent with all the theories of monetary policy I know. Um, I am concerned about the fact that we have uh, a lot of a lot of debt, and at some point uh, we're going to have to do something about it. I just don't think right now is the time to do it. Um, I mean, leverage is a problem if you if you're going to default on it, and so a lot of the household leverage was a problem because people couldn't couldn't pay for the houses they were buying, or they couldn't uh, pay off the the uh, the lo extra loans or what whatever they were doing that that was uh, all the borrowing was was paying for. But uh, so the question is. Are we in danger um, of having a government uh, sort of collapse uh, because we can't pay our bills? And I think the answer to that is no. We're not at really a threat point of the Treasury being unable to pay its but, bills. But Martin, let, let me just uh, push that a little bit further because you say now isn't the right time to do it. But uh, when is the right time to do it? I mean, it's been quite a while since, since 2008. And if, in fact, we are seeing bubbles develop, we may be close to entering the next cycle. It's kind of like someone in the, uh, at the conference made the comment that I think it was Peter Fisher that uh, the crisis is not the best time to address moral hazard. Uh, well, when you have uh, 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 the sense that we have now of a continuing crisis, uh, when is the right time to deal with these problems and get policy back uh, adjusted correctly? Well, I think we could put in place a, uh, a policy over the next 10 years to address our, our deficit. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's a longer run problem goes back before the crisis is that the amount of tax revenue collecting is not match with, with what we want to spend. So either we've got to tax more or we've got to spend less. And the politicians don't, don't want to address either one of those. Uh, and they're going to have to try find a way to, to do it. And we've had various commissions who've said how, how you do it. And, and uh, right at the moment, we're, we're getting a break because the cost of uh, health care is going up much more slowly than um, the government contribution to health care is going up much more slowly. If that were to continue, that would help us out a lot in terms of balancing the, the budget. Yes, right here. And then Don. François JVB, a question for uh, both Professor Taylor and Dr. Bailey. What role or which role should asset prices play in the conduct of monetary policy, you know, ex ante? Expose we can 
perhaps s speculate that we know where you know, bubbles you know, are. So that's pretty much the first you know, question. The second question, if uh, you don't mind, Professor Taylor, if we were to go back to 2003, looking at the terror rule, I suppose the question is, you know, absent the accumulative monetary policy of the Fed at the time, what would have been the performance of the US economy? Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, I think that the, uh, you can overdo the reaction to asset prices as a central bank. Uh, the, the focus more, is more on what's happening to overall inflation, what's happening to the overall growth of the economy. That works much better. If you start reacting to asset prices, you're likely to make things worse. That's what we've seen in history. That's what we've seen in models. I actually just saw it recently in Sweden where they reacted to, to really, in this case, some, uh, some debt ratios, not the regular thing, and then now they have to, have to reverse. Uh, so let me go from that to the question about 2003, 4, and 5, because I think it's quite related. I think then, if the rates were at that point maybe three percentage points off based on not just Taylor rule but many other considerations, I think a higher rate at that point would have led to much less of a uh, – of excesses, if you like, in, in both housing and other places. Uh, you can sh I've showed that back in 2007 uh, using models that that would be, the it would be a different world in that respect. And so I think that's part of the answer to your question. I don't think we would have had as much of a run-up in housing prices and, and excesses in the financial markets, and therefore that bust would have been much less severe. I couldn't say it was going to be, it would be eliminated, but it would have been much less of that boom and bust. And, and that, so I think the economy would have performed better, certainly overall, it's an example sometimes where, where you have boom-bust monetary policy, and it looks like the right thing to do at the time, but it, but it ends up causing the cycle, and it's actually worse at the time. So that would be my characterization of the counterfactual. Um, I think the asset price bubble you need to worry about is when they, there's a lot of leverage associated with buying those assets. Uh, we had, a, after all, an asset price bubble in, in stocks, and it crashed, and yes, we had a recession, but it was relatively mild and, and wasn't in retrospect, wasn't that, that big a deal. So I, I think that's the thing where you, you maybe would want to take action, although um, if you've got the right regulatory structure in place, then maybe that is, uh, is an easier way if to address it. If it's going to blow back into the financial system. If it's going to blow back into the financial uh, system, then you need to be concerned about it. I think back in, in uh, if I'd have been on the Fed in 2003 or four, I don't know that I would have followed John's uh, advice that he's, He's given, uh, I think you gave at the time, or you were giving then, because you wanted the economy to, to recover from the recession we've been in 2001. Um, so I think with the benefit of hindsight, from my point of view anyway, we could say it would have been better to have higher rates if we could have avoided the kind of crisis that we had. Don? Thanks. Uh, Donald Merritt from the Urban Institute. Uh, with, with the brave new world of monetary policy, I get the sense that it's harder for normal human beings, uh, including those in Washington if they count, um, to understand what monetary policy is doing and trying to accomplish. And so, for example, with quantitative easing, my sense is that popular discussion typically equates the amount of stimulus the Fed is providing to the flow of purchases that it's making. However, also, if you listen to the Fed, it sounds like the Fed often believes that the stimulus they're providing uh, is actually based on the stock of assets that it owns, not just the flow of purchases. And there seems to be a disconnect, at least often, between what I think I hear the Fed trying to say and what a lot of media coverage and popular discussion is. And whether you think the effect of Fed policy is good or bad, I'm wondering, you know, which should we focus on? The stock of assets that it owns, the flow with which it purchases them, or some mix of those two? Well, I, I think more feel more comfortable with the stock. But the truth is, we don't really know. The, the empirically, People, the Fed's all over the map on this. They usually measure the impact on the basis of a flow measure, how much the stock changes in a period or is announced to change, and they, they see an impact, and there are impacts at that point. But they tend to dwindle over time, and uh, because the, the markets, there's some substitutability issues, so, so those impacts dwindle over time. But I think your point here is it is, it's, it is hard to understand what the policy is or its impacts huge difference of opinions about its impact. Uh, no, very little information about it compared to what the impacts of interest rates are or more conventional policy. 
And so that's that's really one of the big concerns that I've always had about this. That's why there's, I think, been a downside as well as an upside risk. And I, I see it continuing. You can see it in Japan. You can see it coming in Europe. You can see it in other countries. And so your brave new world is kind of a scary term, but I'm afraid that if we don't make some corrections, that's where we're going. It would, it would not be good. I, I would, um, I think that the, the Fed believes that it, it has to affect expectations, and I think it, it, it uh, is, is trying to, to do what you say it's not doing, because it's, uh, people don't necessarily understand the policy, but I think part of the motivation of these policies was to say the Fed has to be seen to be doing something. And so I think that was a lot of what was going on with the, with the QE. We can't l let it be thought that was, there's no more ammunition in the, in, the, in the gun, so to speak. Right here. I'm curious about uh, Emily Messner from Hoover. Um, I'm curious about every time I hear complaints about the economy not doing well enough, two key components are the growth rate and housing starts, which you gentlemen also mentioned. And what I'm wondering is, given that the annual population growth of the United States is less than 1%, it's around 0.7% right now, and given that vacancy rates in housing tend to range between about 2 and 10%, lower for homes and higher for rentals, but nonetheless, plenty of openings, um, why it is that a 2% or 2.5% growth rate is so bad, and why it is that more housing starts would be so urgently needed. Um, I'm curious what, what that's about. Well, I, I think you raise uh, an excellent point, which is that the growth of the, of the labor force is much slower now. Uh, labor force participation has dropped uh, in a way that may be partly because of the lack of job opportunities, but certainly labor force growth going forward is going to be much slower, and so I don't think we're going to go back to um, the, the time when the, the growth of potential or the trend rate of growth was was three and a half percent because we just we're in a different uh, different environment from the growth of the, of the labor force on, on the housing uh, yes we, we don't need as many houses as we built back in the boom uh, I think we now in a, in a place where we could do with some more houses uh, a lot of people are living with their parents and and uh, maybe living uh, in, in uh, not living in separate households uh, so that, you know, and, and I'm just wanting to get more demand in the system so that we get uh, a little bit more uh, full utilization of our resources. So that's, uh, that's the thing that housing gave us in, uh, in the earlier years that it's not giving us now. So I just said, I think growth is, is just so important. Uh, you know, we've had uh, living standards for certain parts of the population going down. We don't have as many resources to spend if we could have had more growth. I think if population growth is slower, that's that's the way it is, but you still have productivity, and that's really what the difference is. If you get 1.5% or 2% even productivity, it is a much better world than a 1% or 1.5%. And, and that's that. what we focus on, and, and that's what's so disappointing. Uh, I mean, all the resources that are, I think, have wasted because we have not had that return. Again, we, we missed out, I think, on a 4 5 6% growth for a couple of years, and it's gone. And that's a lot of a lot of uh, money for people, money for government, and, and it's a disappointment. So that's why I focus on the growth more. Housing is just a component, so maybe more or less. It's uh, that's that's for people to decide for themselves whether they're going to live with their parents. But or there, not. Are, there are a lot of parents ready to get the kids out of the house. <laughs> Go, yeah, right. Go yeah. ahead, right here. Hi, I'm Jim Hoagland, the Washington Post, and visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution. Um, one of the consequences of the Fed's actions, QE two, three, um, is that the Fed has accumulated $4 trillion on its balance sheet, uh, which puts the United States for the first time really in the company of most mm -hmm. uh, countries, uh, of having that kind of balance sheet. Is this a good thing going forward? Would, would either of you, both of you, comment on uh, whether uh, this is likely to be an effective policy, or does it make any difference? So I, I don't think it's good. It's the balance sheet is that big. Um, it, it's at a point where the interest rate, it, that's why the interest rate slammed down to zero effectively, uh, because there's just so much supply compared to the demand for reserves. I would like to see a world where, where it used to be, where the interest rate was determined by the supply and demand reserves as a, as a market interest rate. 
that sort of uh, contains the, the Fed's uh, wide open possibilities that the balance sheet is always big. That's just another instrument to use with more QE. That, and there will, if, there will be QE4s and QE5s. How, how could you think there wouldn't be? You know, the next recession, it's gonna, they're going to be talking about that. So, so to me, you get the balance sheet back to a point where it determines the supply and, the, the supply and demand reserves, determines the interest rate, and that's how policy should be formulated. And um, for, it's going to be a long time before we get there, to be sure, and so they'll have other ways to set the interest rate. But ultimately, I think that's where we should be going. Yeah, I'd like to see a situation where the Fed's balance sheet was more back to normal, but I'm not in a hurry for them to, to do it. I think they will let this, uh, these assets run off as they, uh, as they mature, and uh, hopefully we'll get the strong growth and the productivity you're describing, and we won't have to do this stuff again. But, but this is a little bit like the debt question. I mean, if you, put your, if you look into your crystal ball and say, what, what, what do you think the Fed's balance sheet is going to look like 10 years from now? Uh, some of it depends on the timing of the next downturn, but but what what would your your guess be? I mean, it's easier it's easier to see this going on and on and up than it is to see it neatly coming down to zero, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the Fed's plan is to have it high, just come down very gradually over time, and by that length of time, it's it's really not a permanent thing it's until not, the next crisis. Yeah, right. Which could be any time. I, I can't, uh, I'm not sure about the future. I mean, we did have a period of uh, slow productivity growth from the early 70s until the, the mid-1990s, and then productivity improved again. So I hope we get a resurgence like that again, and uh, we're not faced with, with having constantly rising uh, balance sheet like, like that, but I don't know. Someone have a brilliant last question? Uh, Can I just follow up on that? Sure, Jim. Yeah. It's my understanding that the Fed essentially, with very little public discussion, uh, has decided to maintain the balance sheet at its current level. It will uh, essentially roll over uh, its purchases. Uh, I believe that's correct. For the time, yes, that's the, that's the, the next step. And they haven't set a, a date. Uh, so they will be maintaining uh, a balance sheet of $4 trillion plus, as far as I can see, for the indefinite future. So the, the intent is that it will go down. Eventually. It's the, the intent is that it will go down. I don't know exactly how they characterize that at different points, but it, and it has changed. But now the intent is that it will gradually go down. But I say if it's so large for so long, it does become permanent in a sense. And how do you, you know, something is there five years, ten years, you know, it already will be, if it's just five more years, it's already going to be 11 years. And that's, that's enough time that people just get used to that. It's also to think about it globally, think what Japan's doing, think what the ECB may do. And so it, be, it just becomes a way of doing monetary policy in the future. That's this brave new world. So, so let me ask as the last question. We just had an election, uh, changes the power equation somewhat in, in, uh, in the city. The Senate's now in the hands of Republicans. Does that change the outlook for any of the uh, uh, significant pieces of the puzzle we've been talking about tonight. I think this, uh, we were talking about the reform of the bankruptcy code. I, I think there's a possibility of, uh, of that moving. Um, uh, the, Randy Gwynn is here in the audience. He wrote a very important piece for the book on this. There's legislation in the, in the House, legislation in the Senate. They could come together, and I think the president would sign that. So that seems to me one piece of legislation relative to what we're talking about, which is important and could actually get through. So we'll hope, I'm hoping for that one. Martin, well, I think I'd like to be optimistic and say, you know, both sides are going to feel that they want to get something done and they'll look for, for things to do. And, and maybe we'll reform the corporate tax code and, and build the, the pipelines and, and uh, maybe we'll do a, a reform bill on, on Dodd-Frank to get some of the you know, the, a big bill like that, you always have corrections, and I think there's some things that could be uh, improved you, you, there. You place bets on any of those things? No, I wouldn't place too much <laughs> bets on that. I'm just saying I like to be optimistic. <laughs> All right, good. Very much. Uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you.